boink. Okay, before we start <laughs> rendering the lard, I want to read something to you. So I just want y'all to bear with me, but I know, you know, you can do certain videos and there's always going to be some people that just don't agree and just think it's awful and no, no, no. So I just want to read something to you and you can go with it or, or not or, you know, a lot of us live by the old days and how things were done and, uh, the health benefits of stuff and stuff that wasn't good for you and stuff that was good for you. Now they're saying it's not good for you, but I just want to read this to you and it's a really good read. Mr. Brown found it and, uh, it comes from a lady that has a blog and she's called the Daring Gourmet and she does a lot of neat stuff. And from what I gather, she does a lot of research on stuff, too. But it says how to render lard and why you should use it. Now, I want before I start reading this, I just want to tell you, you know, Danny and I was raised with, you know, raised in butchering hogs and your parents and grandparents rendering lard. <laughs> and all you really know is, you know, you, you see it in your mind is back there in the back 40 with a big old kettle over an open fire with a hog sticking out of it, you know, and that's not always the case because I'm going to show you an easier way to render lard, and of course it's not, you know, 100 pounds of lard, it's about 30, but still, but anyways, I'm going to read this to you because I just want to give you a little information on lard. It says, chances are the vast majority of people reading the title and looking at this bottle of lard and it's a beautiful quart jar of just beautiful white lard and it says we'll have a negative reaction. What will follow is the pronouncement of a string of health conditions that through decades of medical myths have come to be associated with eating lard. In the meantime, our ancestors are shaking their heads. Our average lifespan was as long as yours and we didn't have nearly the number of health conditions as you do today. So what happened? What caused this to, what caused us to reject one of our ancestors' most basic food staples? I won't attempt to give you all the reasons, but I will provide you a really good starting point where the USA, when early nineteen hundreds, who Proctor, Proctor and Gamble. Have y'all heard of them? <laughs> and I'm not cutting Proctor and Gamble down, believe me. They had a booming business producing cotton, which, by the way, is not considered a food crop by the FDA. And that's important. But there was this unwanted portion of the cotton plant, which is called the cotton seed, that they couldn't do anything with. And they had lots and lots of it. So they put their heads together to come up with something they could not, they could do with cottonseed in order to profit from it. And, you know, that's always what everybody wants to do is profit from everything. So, drum roll, please. They discovered a method of intense processing that enabled them to extract oil from the cottonseed. And at virtually zero expense to them, they done this. But they found the oil was unstable at room temperature and turned rancid very easy. So you enter hydrogenation. Did I say that right? Hydrogenation. They figured out that hydrogenating the stuff made it stable and last a long time. So... And here comes the what. The end result was an oil that looked like lard. So what did they call it? Crisco. An issue of popular science summed it up this way. What was garbage in 1860 was fertilizer in 1870. Cattle fed in 1880 and table food and many things else in the 1890s. And it changed the way we thought about food and the way we ate for generations. The legacy 
The anti-lard and butter mindset is established and still continues today. Did you know that more marketing, more marketing, <laughs> did you know that marketing dollars were spent on making Crisco a success in any other market endeavor up to that point in history? So, Crisco was, it was a big thing. And I guess it still is, because I use it. There's some in my refrigerator. Um, it's not made out of cottonseed oil. It's made out of soybean and, uh, I forget, I'll have to look. <laughs> what ensued from this point on what can only be summed up as one of the greatest, most widespread, and most misfortunate health scandals of all time with health and consequences we're still reaping. On one hand, while Crisco was being marketed as cheaper and healthier than lard or butter, simultaneously marketing dollars were spent labeling butter and lard as bad. They even gave away free cookbooks with every purchase of Crisco. And of course you can guess which ingredient replaced everything that normally would have called for butter or lard. Crisco. With so much marketing wealth and power behind the effort, it took only a few years to turn an entire nation away from the source of fat that had been used for centuries by their ancestors, and it was successfully labeled as hazardous to our health. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that's sad, isn't it? Decades later, when illnesses began mounting to the point where the statistics could no longer be ignored, the statement was finally released that hydrogenated oils are bad for you. But the fat phobia continued, as did the manufacturing of substitute oils. So one, one such oil that they use as a substitute oil is canola. Well, guess where canola comes from? No, it's not the canola plant. There's no such thing. The canola plant was de developed in 1970s and is nothing more than a modified crossbred version of the rapeseed plant. The name is the shortened version of a Canada oil low acid and comes from rapeseed. Another non-food crop. Here's a little history on rapeseed oil. During the war, I guess World War II, rapeseed oil was used on naval ships as a lubricant. When the war ended, there was so much farmland in Canada already dedicated to growing rapeseed that they wanted to find other uses for it so they could continue pulling a profit. The problem with rapeseed oil, it's such a terribly foul tasting and rancid smelling oil that it isn't fit for human consumption. And so they spent the next few decades until the 1970s working out a way to make it edible. That process requires heavy refining, bleaching and deodorizing using harsh chemicals, as far from natural as it can get. To finally yield the neutral tasting odorless oil that now sits on the grocery store shelves bearing the American Heart Association seal of approval. <clears throat> now, fast forward to today. Almost all processed and prepackaged foods, everything from chips and breakfast cereal to canned soups and salad dressings, are made with either canola, cottonseed, soybean, or vegetable or corn oil. Why? Because they're, they're cheap to produce. And because we're still in the mindset set that they're somehow better for you than lard or butter. For more information on why soybean and vegetable and corn oil and several others are so bad for you, there's some articles that'll explain why. Well, we've come to a full circle. Medical research over the past several years has continued to confirm that fat is not the devil it's been made out to be, 
and that it's not the root cause of cardiovascular disease. Medical literature is finally starting to reflect this is this as are many health professionals in their medical advice. However, the notion that fat is bad has been so deeply ingrained in our culture and medical philosophy for so long that it's going to take some time before everybody's caught up on the real facts about it. Even many health, prof health professionals are still stuck in the archaic mindset, though we're slowly starting to see the rhetoric change. Our ancestors had it right after all. She says, my philosophy and approach to diet is a simple one and echo centuries of wisdom. Number one, eat real. Re eat real whole foods as close to their natural state as possible. And two, eat things in moderation. Now, you know, I've always stuck to that. I never, you know, I know that I'm overweight, you know, and I'm not going to... Uh, sugarcoat it but when I went through the change of life that was just what happened and I had other few health issues and I'm not going to blame it on all that um, but I don't do diets we don't eat bad we eat healthy and if we eat a piece of pie we eat it in moderation we don't go out and we don't buy candy bars and all that junk and just sit around and eat them but I'm like her. She says, number one, eat real food. Whole foods as close to the natural state as possible. And eat it, things in moderation. So that brings us back to lard. It's a fully natural whole food. It can be made in your own kitchen without any special equipment, and the process could not be simpler, and that's so true. You just melt it, strain it, and use it. And there are a few advantages. Lard has several advantages over other oils and fats. One of them being that it, along with beef tallow, has one of the highest smoke points. And that's a good thing when you're frying and deep frying. That means it doesn't oxidize when you heat, heat it. And oxidization equals cancer. So lard is ideal for high heating cooking. Anything you know, above a light saute, more or less. Lard also has a high melting point, making it the best choice for a good old flaky pie crust and pastries. And even beef tallow, even more so, is good. Get ready to really experience the old-fashioned taste of yesteryear and what made grandma's baking so famous. Lastly, it tastes awesome. Get ready to make the best fried chicken, fried potatoes, and just about anything you want out of this fresh rendered lard. <laughs> and then it says, finally, it has health benefits. That's right. Lard is a good thing. So, we'd have to go into some more articles to talk about health benefits. So, but I do want to talk about the types of fat. The belly. This is what's used in the U.S. to make bacon. In the U.K., it's known as streaky bacon. As its name suggests, it comes from the belly of the pig and has layers of fat and meat. Pork belly has become popular in recent years in a variety of cuisines. You typically wouldn't render the belly into lard because there is too much meat attached to it. Fat back. This comes from the back of the pig, includes the shoulder and rump areas, and is a thick layer of fat directly under the skin. Once rendered, it produces a lard that's slightly yellow in color and has a stronger pork odor and flavor than your leaf fat. It's great for frying and sautéing. Fat back is also used in sausage making. Now, your leaf fat. This is the fat from around the pig's kidney. 
And like beef leaf fat is the cleanest, it's the cleanest fat on the pig, and it's also the healthiest. Once rendered, it produces a lard that's white in color and a mild odor, making it ideal to use for pie crust. So, there you go. Now, she put an important note on here, and it says the health benefits of lard apply only to, only to the health benefits of lard apply only to pasture-raised pork. Fat is where a lot of the bad stuff is stored and concentrated. So, a lot of these pigs being raised in, you know, they're going to have chemicals and additives and byproducts and all kinds of junk. And so it's just for that reason that it's strongly recommended to only use fat from pasture-raised pigs. It says avoid fat from commercially raised pigs. So that was really interesting. I hope you stuck with me. <laughs> I know y'all don't probably like hearing this old country girl tell a story. But uh, I just think it's very important to learn the facts and, uh, and to know about these things. So, we're going to start rendering that good old pig lard for all them flaky crust and fried chicken and all that good stuff. And it's easy to do. So, let's get started. I wanted to bring y'all back and I want to show y'all um, this lard's been in this slow cooker for two hours now and uh, it's melting pretty good but what I'm going to do is what has already melted I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to strain it and get it in my jar because the faster you can get this liquid out as it melts uh, it won't have as strong of a a lard smell. You know, have you ever had lard that was just really was stout? And you know, years ago, like when we would process our own hogs on the farm, Grandpa, we would render lard outside in a big kettle. And of course, that's what Grandma used for everything. For pie crust, uh, for frying chicken, it didn't matter, biscuits. But it was pretty stout smelling lard and uh, I think it's because you done it out there in a kettle and uh, you probably maybe and I'm gonna say left it out there for hours and you may have got left it at probably too high of a temp most of the time and it just got to be a stout lard but that's all we knew that's that's just what you done but nowadays we have we can do it slow cookers but i've only got 30 pounds 
<coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And like I said, I'm only going to do just a few pounds at a time. So I don't have to go outside to a big old kettle and do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to strain what I've got. And uh, I've got a quart jar here. I don't have any more half gallon jars. So what I've got is a quart jar and I've got cheesecloth and I've got a little strainer on, over the top of that. And uh, we're going to strain our Yeah, it's going to go down through there real good. Now the reason for straining this is of course to keep out all the solids. Now I've got quite a bit that I need to strain here. So it's really, it's not going to take very long. It'll take three to four hours to get this 10 pounds of it done. So the slow cooker works real good. Uh, the one thing I haven't done and I need and I need to tell next time I render the other packages, I'm going to take the temp in between. Because really and truly, your lard needs to stay between 140 to 180. Um, you don't want it getting under 140 degrees when you're rendering lard. But I'm going to get the rest of this uh, strained out. And then I'll bring you back and I'll show you what it looks like. I wanted to show y'all what I've got rendered off already in a couple hours. That's a, a quart and a, probably about two-thirds of a pint. And I'm going to let the rest of it render down and I'll get the rest of it strained. But it's, it's real pretty. You can see it's almost clear. Um, I'm going to put cheesecloth over both of them and I'm going to put them in the refrigerator and I'm going to let... Uh, well, that's where you, you know, unless you've got a, a cold, a cool basement, dark basement, you can uh, put them, you know, in a cold place like that, in a cold, dark, um, if you've got a storage, you know, cellar or something like that, like Grandma always had, but I don't, so I'm going to put it in my refrigerator, and it will get used pretty quick. But you can see what, this is what I've got left. And I'm just going to let it finish rendering down. And since uh, they ground this lard for me, it's, it just rendered down pretty quick. So I'm going to let it finish up. And if there's any cracklings left, I'm going to fry them up for Danny. I'm sure there's going to be quite a bit left after it melts down completely. But I think it's doing real good. Now I want to show y'all, you know, not do I just use this fine mesh uh, strainer. That's an old one. But underneath it, I put this cheesecloth. And I want to show you what the cheesecloth caught. I mean, it's... If you're able to do that, you need to do it because you need to get all that strained off of there that you can. It's just sediments, what it is, just from your fat. So it does need to be strained good to get it that pretty and white. So I'm going to finish with this. Put that in the refrigerator, and we'll be back later. Okay, it's been about... Uh, let's see. It's been about 20 minutes since I last strained some of this. And I still got quite a bit in there. I don't know really how much more I'm going to get. But, uh, you see how it's still melting. But I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and strain what I can out of this. And I'm going to leave it in there probably another 30 minutes or so and see how much more I can get out of it. And then we'll just strain all the the uh, cracklings out of it and get as much of the oil as, lard out as I can. And then uh, probably 
probably make another video on the cracklings. So let me get this strained out. Okay, I'm gonna pour, pour my cracklings in my arm skillet. We're just gonna kind of fry them up. Now, what little bit of melted lard was left in there? By this point, it was getting pretty stout. So I just decided that I'd just leave it in there and throw up these cracklings in it. Now, there's a lot you can do with these cracklings. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of uh, I know some of y'all's grandmas have probably made cornbread and put cracklings in it and called it. It's called crackling cornbread. And you can also fry these up and uh, they say they're good on salads. I've never ate any on salads. But I'm sure they'd probably be good in just about anything. So I'm going to let this fry up. And start seeing how that even me getting it putting it in the pan and getting it that much hotter you can see it's rendering some more of that lard out but when you get to this temperature in your lard is when you really start getting the stronger odor and a stronger taste that's what I'm trying to say so I'm going to let these fry up just a little bit, and I'll bring you back. I'm, now, y'all got to be careful, because I'm telling you, these uh, cracklings have been popping all over the place, so be careful. But you see how much more lard has rendered out of them cracklings. What I'm going to do when I get all the cracklings out, I will save this lard, and uh, I will use it to fry chicken out of. It won't go to waste. Okay, there's your pretty browned up deep fried cracklings. Now I'm gonna let these uh, drain just a little bit on this paper towel and I'm gonna let them cool all the way and then I'm gonna put them in a mix jar, put a lid on them and I'll put them in the freezer and I'll just get them out as I need them. You can't, uh, you don't need to leave these out. You can't like put them on the shelf or nothing like that because they'll go rancid. And uh, I don't think I'll use them quick enough just to set them in the fridge. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put them in the freezer and uh, take them out as I go. And like I said, this, and you can see how fine these cracklings are, and that's because uh, the butcher had uh, ground it up. So it was really, and when it is ground up like that, it renders a lot faster too. So let me get these in a jar and we'll finish up. Okay guys, there's my finished product. I just want to show y'all. And it is some pretty, pretty lard. I'm really proud of it. Now I have to tell you, I'm, <clears throat> I was wrong at the beginning. That was it's, that package that I put in the slow cooker was not 10 pounds. Because um, after I got done and got time, I got the other packages out and weighed them. And they were around 5 pounds. So this is what I got out of 5 pounds and of course the cracklings over in the jar <laughs> they was a little bit fuller than that but mr brown has been snacking on them um the one thing i can't tell you is if any of it was leaf or just uh, regular fat because it doesn't sound the packages but i can tell you that it is some really pretty lard let me get this one down where you can really see how white. See how pretty and white it is. I'm really proud of it. So I'm going to keep the lids on these. I'm going to keep one out and then I'll store the rest in the freezer. That's the way I'm going to store them because I've got, I've got about 25 more pounds to render and I'll just do it a little bit at a time till I get it all done. I'm not in no hurry. I'll even keep the jar cracklings out in the freezer 
<laughs> if they're out there, my Mr. Brown won't go in there and eat all of them, but he says they're really good. Um, but really and truly, they need to be kept in the freezer. Now, this is not long-term uh, shelf stable, so that it does need to be in the refrigerator, in the freezer, for best results. So there you go, guys. I hope y'all like this video. I know it was another long video, but to learn processes like this, just like on different things, you know, you can't do it in five minute, 10 minute videos. So if you like it, give me a thumbs up, share it. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It, it really does help. So God bless everybody. Come back and see me and uh, we love you guys. Bye.